morning, good afternoon, good evening to you who are joining us online. Grateful that you're with us and uh, trust that as God always does, he'll be faithful to, to speak to us through his word. We'll listen and that after we hear what he has to say by his grace, may we do what he has to say to us this morning. The title of this message, it's the fourth in a six part series, just a short series through Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel. And this, this message is called The Life of Courage. And it, what it simply is, is an affirmation that as, certainly as Christians now, we live in a whole different time than when Daniel was here. We live on this side of Jesus, living on earth and dying and rising again and ascending into heaven until he comes back. We're living in a whole other world than Daniel was in. But just like Daniel was called to be courageous, we are, we are certainly called to be courageous as Christians. And uh, so... The theme of the, of the message is this, godly courage is the overflow of an abiding awareness of him, where we can say, I'm, I'm never alone, and the one who's with me is greater than anything I'll ever face, including whatever it is I'm facing right now. Godly courage is the overflow of an abiding awareness of him, and the application is when it's only a matter of time, maybe you find yourself in the middle of this right now. When opposition arises and conflicts come, stand firm and be courageous. Some of you, I imagine all of us, uh, all of you who are joining us, uh, no doubt have either heard of or seen The Wizard of Oz. I believe it was the first movie ever to be uh, produced in color after they uh, get to The Wicked Witch is Dead and then it turns into color as they head off on the yellow brick road. You can tell, tell it's yellow. Well, in that movie, there are the three characters from her life, uh, uh, and there's the uh, Tin Man who didn't have a what? A heart. And there's the Scarecrow who didn't have a what? And there's a lion who didn't have what? Exactly. And, and that lion is a sermon illustration. Because the last thing a lion should be is timid, right? That was the whole premise of it, and there's some great lines in that movie, but, but that lion should never have not been courageous. But he knew something was wrong, and he knew he needed to get it fixed. And so uh, may, may that be uh, part of the example to us this morning. When it comes, who comes and what comes to mind when you think about courage and bravery? What comes to mind and who comes to mind when you think about courage and bravery? Perhaps someone not just willing, but actually risking their life to save the life of someone else? You see that in some heroic rescue efforts when the person rescuing the person in danger is in danger themselves by doing that. Maybe the story of Erin Brockovich. Who remembers her? Erin, yes, Erin Brockovich. Uh, what a courageous woman. She single-handedly stood up to Pacific Gas and Electric in Hinckley, California back in the day for their groundwater contamination. You couldn't shut her up. You couldn't because she knew something was wrong and it needed to be dealt with. And she was, a, she was the poster child for courage in that city. That took, that took a lot of, of, of guts. Or one of my favorites in, in the scriptures is, is uh, back in 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath. That little, that, that little guy, it, I remember as Pat Hurley said that, you know, where most people would think that Goliath was too big to take down, David knew that Goliath was too big to miss. And so, so David uh, exhibited great courage in taking down Goliath single-handedly when the entirety of the Israeli armies day after day after day trembled in front of him. Courage on full display. And so uh, there are examples. Today we'll see another great one in uh, chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. We'll see Daniel not cowering at all when asked to interpret the handwriting on the wall in Nebuchadnezzar's son or grandson. My understanding in the Greek is it just means predecessor. Most people think it's his, his, his son, but it could have been his grandson, Belshazzar, in that palace. And it was 23 years after uh, Nebuchadnezzar's death. Babylon was under siege by the armies of the Medo-Persian Empire. If you read the book of Daniel, you see that. So the whole context in which this takes place is, is, is the... Uh, the, the Medo Persians have 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 this have Babylon under siege. That that means it's only a matter of time before they win, uh, apart from some kind of intervention or or help from others. Belshazzar was between a rock and a hard place, having decided, in the midst of this tension and conflict, 
that everybody knows they're under siege. Life is not easy these days. And what, what, is, what does Belshazzar do? He throws a party and everybody gets drunk. And the vessels that he uses to drink from are the gold vessels taken from the palace in Jerusalem, from the temple in Jerusalem. So there's desecration and debauchery and, and drunkenness. And it's in the context of that that God shows up and supernaturally writes on the wall in the king's palace, getting everyone's attention. And then once again, not unlike with Nebuchadnezzar and his dream, Daniel shows up to interpret the supernatural uh, revelation from God where somehow or another fingers appear and writing on the wall takes place. Could you imagine being in that room? Uh, imagine more than a few people sobered up pretty quickly when they saw that. And uh, that's what the, the context of this is. Uh, and we'll see the courage that Daniel displayed. Fearless. Um, uh, you know, just, uh, it, it goes along with last week's message about being confident, confident in courage. Confidence and courage, or at least cousins, that's for sure. But Daniel exhibited both of them. So here's the focus of, of this message. Courage is captivating. Whenever it's seen, it both inspires and challenges us deeply. We are stirred with gratitude to see something so right being so clearly displayed. And we are equally confronted with wherever it is we are on the courage scale. When we see somebody who's exhibiting courage far beyond the courage we've ever exhibited, it is both inspiring and then it's also kind of like, ugh, um, you know, I, I, I need some help in, in, that, in that area. Courage isn't always needed, but when it is needed, it's a precious, priceless, and profound gift to the recipients of the courageous one's actions, right? Courage isn't always necessary, but when it is necessary and somebody with courage either shows up or is already there and, and displays that, that courage in action, Everybody who's the recipient of that is a very, very grateful person. Not unlike confidence, courage should be especially valued and validated by us as the people of God. Big thing here. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the conquering of fear by the presence of faith. In fact, courage can't be clearly seen without the backdrop of something dangerous or threatening, right? Because there'd be no need for courage in that scenario. So when it's all happening and someone with courage connected to their confidence in God is there and does what only that person can do with that kind of courage, uh, it's, reason, it's, reason to, it's reason to give thanks. Here in Daniel chapter 5, we see Daniel showing us what it looks like when someone who knows God is calling them to do the right, someone knows Shows what it looks like when someone knows God is calling them to do the right thing, even if it means that on the other side of their courageous act, it could bring them great peril and pain. Let me read that without messing it up. We see Daniel showing us what it looks like when someone knows God is calling them to do the right thing, even if it means that on the other side of their courageous act, it could bring them great peril and pain. The person who's being courageous isn't thinking about consequences. They're thinking about the situation. We saw that just this week out in California. Mass shootings every day this week is staggering. But that one, the guy who went into, uh, it was a New, Year's, a New Year's Day or something that with a bunch of, uh, it was an Asian, uh, club, I remember, and then he, he kills several people and goes to the next club, and have you seen the video of this guy disarming him, the gun, disarming him? Because he, he, he sees him cocking it or loading it, getting it ready to fire, and he sees that opportunity, and he pounces. And in the interview, he even says, I didn't think about anything, I just acted. That is, that is courage showing up and taking over. It's a beautiful thing when it doesn't. Well, and I thought about this. We haven't said it yet during this series, uh, but here it goes. Dare to be a Daniel, right? There's the hymn called Dare to be a Daniel. We should, I should have said that before now because that's the invitation. You see Daniel in his, in his life, and we'll see the impact he has in these next two messages too, how God uses him because of how aware, and we'll see that clearly this morning, how completely aware Daniel is wherever he goes and wherever he is that he is not alone. 
that he knew that God was with him and that God had gifted him and he was there to do what God called him to do. So, the first point this morning, a life of courage is the result, and I just alluded to it, is the result of living for an audience of one. And who's that one? God. It's, it, it bears repeating. It, we need to be more concerned about what God knows than what people may think. We need to be more concerned with what God knows. And we need to be more aware of what God can do. And the only way we can become more aware of what God can do is to have God do more in us and through us. And Daniel is, a, is an example, again, of that ever-increasing awareness. Listen, he, he came through then. He, he, he's going to come through now. And if there's anything else ahead to get through, he's going he's to come through there. Uh, confident. And bringing courage to the equation. Under the first point it says, Daniel lived to know, please, and honor God. And before we look at the passages here in the scripture, it's important to note, or interesting to note, that there are more than a few similarities here with the story we looked at last week when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And to this week when Belshazzar got a handwritten note <laughs> uh, from God. The biggest one, of course, is Daniel. He's the constant variable in each of those scenarios and in the ones we'll look at ahead. Daniel is, when, when Daniel's there, you know something good is going to happen. Even though to the recipient of, it, recipients of it, it might not seem good. Certainly to Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He didn't bring them happy news. And in fact, we see in this chapter, and Daniel reminds us, that not long after the Belshazzar, uh, you know, the, 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 not long after the dream was interpreted, uh, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, you know how his life ended? Eating, like a crazy person, just eating grass out in, out in the field. He was, he, he was insane. It was, it, God's judgment fell so quickly. And so the, so the similarities are, the biggest one is Daniel. He, I'm sorry, he is no longer a teenager, but in this chapter, we fast forward it, decades, he's between 80 and 85 years old. And while much has changed, much has stayed the same, and mainly it's Daniel. And the similarities are certainly con con connected to the two kings. And at the end of this chapter, Darius shows up. And what is Daniel's interaction with Darius? Darius gets duped, we'll see that. He's made to sign a foolish decree. Daniel winds up in spending a night with the lions. It was Darius who was concerned for him. He was a good king that came along after this guy, after Belshazzar. All that for the sake of context. As before, Daniel is up for the task because he continued to maintain his walk with and witness for God. Between what we looked at last time and, and what we're looking at today, we, there's the story of, of his three friends in, in the furnace. And the... the so there was that. Uh, they came unscathed through what for them became a harmless fiery furnace. A furnace that was so hot when they were thrown in, the people throwing them in were killed. That's how hot the furnace was. But it wasn't hot for them. They came out, didn't even smell the smoke. Incredible. So, so there's a reason to trust God. Daniel was a witness to that. His friends came through. And... Um, and uh, it, Daniel, through it all, maintained his good name. And he maintained his good name through all of his adult years till the day he died. And what was the key? And that's what we see this morning. What is the key to Daniel's impact and influence in the, in, in the life that he lived? It was this very point. That Daniel lived his life first and foremost for God and God alone. That is why Daniel had the impact and the influence he had. That is why when people in trouble, they rang him up. That's why they, they, they looked for him. Because first and foremost, in Daniel's mind and heart, was God and God alone. There was nobody who took God's place in Daniel's mind and heart. First and, and only always. And that was... That was Daniel's default, that was his decision, his commitment, his ongoing uh, experience. Because, because he kept God where God is supposed to be in the mind and the heart of a person, Daniel's life 
became evidence of the results of that happening. And we, have, we, can, we can be so encouraged and, and have so, so very much to learn. Again, Daniel lived his life first and foremost for God and God alone. His very present audience of one was his priority. And it was A.W. Tozer, who pastored in Akron for a while. After he passed away, many of his sermons were turned into books. Um, just a great theologian. And it was A.W. Tozer who said this. And it's profound. Whatever comes to mind when you think God is one of the most important things about you. Right? Whatever comes to your mind when you think God is one of the most important things about you. And it will, it will define and determine and drive your life. And if you and I are, are thinking about a God who doesn't exist, or a God of our own making instead of the God of the Bible, or a God who's been terribly misrepresented to us, a caricature of God rather than the reality of God, if what we think about God isn't God, we're in trouble. And our life can't be what God intends it to be. Which is why it's, you know, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That, that it's imperative that what comes to mind when we think God is what the Bible says and what the Bible tells us about who God is. It's the only way to know for sure is to listen to what he says about himself through his word. And again, one of the most important things about anybody is what comes to their mind when they think God. Obviously, Daniel, uh, Daniel's thoughts about God were very much in line with the reality of who God was and is and will always be. So let's uh, look at these passages. I won't read the, the, the whole chapter. It, like the other ones are, are very long, is very long. I want to acknowledge that at the beginning of this, of course, starting in verse 1, uh, it clearly says that, that Belshazzar is throwing a, a party, a banquet for uh, a thousand of his nobles and, and was drinking wine with them. It, that says that the wine that he was drinking was being, was being uh, imbibed, if that's the right word, with the vessels that had been stolen as booty from Jerusalem, the temple, and brought to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And so... That, that, that this is just a recipe for trouble, that's for sure. Uh, and, and he goes on to describe that. Uh, verse 4, as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver. Hey! <laughs> that, that's just so sad. And only by grace do we know that. But the gods of gold and silver. And the gods of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And stone. Listen, there's only one God who's responsible and behind all of those things and everything there is. Only one. But they had these gods, these false gods, these idols that they worshipped. And so they're, they're, as it were, toasting these gods of gold and silver with the gold and silver that they stole from the temple in Jerusalem. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Verse 5 is where it happens. Suddenly, whenever you, the word, whenever you see the word suddenly in the Bible, um, pay attention. Because it is very much connected to an abrupt transition, either for good or for bad. Um, so suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. I've never... I, I have fainted and gone out before and felt that last minute thing, but I've never, uh, I don't know if you have ever been stayed, stayed aware and awake while you were so overwhelmed that you're actually, your knees were knocking, shaking, and you could not stand up because you were so overwhelmed. I have a friend who experienced that and wound up on the floor crawling when she discovered she got a call that her son had murdered someone. That kind of news that doesn't just shake you, but it takes you down. That's what this was. And uh, again, uh, it, it, the, the timing of it, just, just incredible. And so uh, the king calls out for the enchanters, the astrologers, and, and the diviners, the diviners, not unlike Nebuchadnezzar looking for his, uh, the best he had to offer, offer with his astrologists and the priests and, and the wise men. Again, just like Nebuchadnezzar didn't as king, Belshazzar doesn't as king. 
turn to God. He calls for the enchanters and astrologers and, and diviners or diviners to be brought and, uh, and said to these wise men of Babylon, you know, help interpret this. And so the verses that we're looking at here follow, too, I want to highlight this. Not unlike, and again, this is a similarity, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, the queen here comes to Belshazzar. And you see that in verse 10. O king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Now, she misunderstood what that was, but she, she understood that Daniel was different. And we'll drop down to verse 18 and get back to those verses. Um, but in verse 18, Daniel says, when he's brought before the king, O king, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. That, that is, is evidence that Daniel knew who he was talking about. It was the God that Daniel knew, not the gods that you think you know, who did this. Daniel knew who God was, and Daniel had an ongoing, present tense relationship with him. That's the way it should be. And then also, if you'll drop down to verse 23, this verse highlights the reality of the result of living for an audience of one, that Daniel was able to say this. Instead, you, and he's, he's rebuking Belshazzar. And this is where the courage is on full display. In verse uh, 23, he says, Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And he says what he's done with the goblets from his temple, and you drank the wine, you praised the gods of silver. But it's in verse 23 that Daniel is acknowledging he knows who Belshazzar is avoiding. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Daniel knew who God was. Daniel knew what that meant. And Daniel knew it was God who gave him the ability to do what he did. Way back there as a teenager with Nebuchadnezzar and now in his 80s with Belshazzar. He knew God. Because even in the, again, in the midst of, um, just imagine Daniel coming in with all thousands of these people. They'd been, they'd been drinking and they were under the influence. And then this handwriting happens and Daniel comes into this situation. And in the midst of all those people and whatever the buzz must have been, and the king himself, what we see here is Daniel's audience of one was still his audience of one in a place filled with a ton of people. Do you see that? That even with all this going around and all these people with him, Daniel clearly was aware of and, and in, a, and in a, uh, a very real way acknowledging, this is the one I know, and this is the one you've done this against, and this is the one who gave Nebuchadnezzar the, the abilities and blessings he had in spite of, not because of, who he was and what he did. So, um, acknowledging this, that Daniel's reputation, Daniel knew, and we'll see again, we'll, we'll come back to this, Every, many people around Daniel knew this about him, and Daniel was aware of this concerning himself. His reputation and his abilities were from God. His reputation and his abilities were from God. Somebody who's raised up to a very high place and is very well known for whatever it is they do, the only reason they're very good at what they do and they're very well known for what they do is because God gave them the ability to do that. Whoever that person is and whatever platform God puts them on. If, if, if humility doesn't, doesn't, if humility doesn't accompany their placement on the platform, it won't be long before they're not on the platform anymore, right? It's, it's pretty clear. And uh, some of us are old enough to remember George Herbert Walker Bush. Anybody alive when he was president? Some, um, many of us are. Yeah, many of us would know that. Maybe some of you uh, don't, uh, younger people. Obviously, George Herbert Walker Bush is the father of the following President George W. Bush. And I remember, that, I guess it was back in the 80s, whenever Bush was president, just for that one term, um, the, his chief of staff, was featured in Newsweek magazine. Now, can anybody recall his name? Does anybody know who George Herbert Walker Bush's chief of staff was? Anybody? I'll give you a, a bite of Frosty, if you know. Susan? Don't Google it! 
Oh, somebody's Googling it, I thought. No, no, no. It was John Sununu, a very fun name to say. John Sununu was interviewed as the chief of staff for the president of the United States. And you know what, you know what he said? He made it very clear at the, at the beginning. This is my job. My job is George Herbert Walker Bush. Wherever he is, whatever he wants, whatever's going on, he's my business. And, 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 and he even said a similar thing. He said, I only have one boss to please. He happens to be the president of the United States of America, but I only have one boss. And my job isn't just to make him happy. My job is to help make him successful. And in the same way John Sununu knew the reason he had a job is because Bush was president, Daniel knew the reason he was who he was is because God is God. And Daniel's only concern was God, wherever that took him and whatever it meant. So again, the first point this morning to set up the second point, a courageous life is the result of living for an audience of one. And the second point, the bulk of this is acknowledging that a courageous life is, among other things, inspiring, compelling, encouraging, and contagious. Among other things, a courageous life is inspiring and compelling and how could you not include encouraging, because courage is the root word of encouraging, and courageous, courage is the root word of courageous. Uh, it's an encouraging life, and then it's very contagious. Daniel's courage, under the second point, and here's what Daniel's courage did in this scenario. Daniel's courage rebuked the depravity and the debauchery of those around him. His courage was not necessarily a welcome thing. Because as sure as it called out the king, it called out all the partiers who were worshiping these false gods. So Daniel's, Daniel's, Daniel's courage rebuked the depravity and debauchery of those around him. Uh, here is where we see how courage is always willing to take its place and take its stand. Again, similarly to the way that Daniel was not afraid to approach Nebuchadnezzar after his audience of one had revealed to him what the dream was and what the dream meant. Here in this chapter, Daniel does not hesitate to stand before the king who could have him executed in a heartbeat. Daniel comes courageous, bold, aware, alert, again, confident. And he is willing to take his place because the place of courage inside of him allowed him to do that, and not only to take his place, but to take his stand. And courage equips us and enables us to do that. To do that. Daniel wasn't intimidated or afraid. That, that it's not even hinted at, at at all. Perhaps there was in his humanity and, and, and realizing, oh, this could go bad and it could be the end of me. Maybe there was some apprehension. But again, the courage that he had uh, granted him the ability to not be intimidated or not be afraid. He had a past preoccupation with the one he was going to walk in with before Belshazzar. Daniel knew that God was not going to not accompany him to that meeting. Nobody else knew God was there, but Daniel knew God was there because Daniel knew who God was. And so um, he, 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 he uh, was able to do that to not be intimidated or afraid because he had that past ongoing preoccupation with and reputation for God and that was all on the inside and it kept showing up on the outside here's your man here's the guy here's the one who can do it get a hold of him because of his integrity and his reputation and his confidence and his courage so look at what these verses tell us and show us back to Daniel 5 11 through 12 we'll start in verse 10 I think I mentioned it, read it before. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. And the voices of the king and nobles, according to verse 9, was that they were terrified and grew even more terrified and grew even more pale, and his nobles were baffled. Verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O king, live forever. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. And here it is in verses 11 and 12, where Daniel's courageous life 
is uh, referenced and elevated. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods. She's wrong about that, but she's right about a man in your kingdom. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Again, her reference point for her worldview is whacked, but she knows Daniel's something else. Uh, King, Nebuchadnezzar, king Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners, diviners. Uh, this man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel. <laughs> Wisest thing that you could say. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. And so, again, Daniel's previous life had already been inspiring, compelling, encouraging, and contagious. It, it had an influence and an impact that couldn't be denied. And then if you'll uh, drop down to verses 22 through 29, uh, David, or, I'm sorry, Daniel uh, acknowledges what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar, driven away from people, given the mind of an animal, lived with wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew until he acknowledged that the Most High is sovereign. God put him down to, so he could be raised up. Verse 22. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Again, don't just let us not blow right by that and not understand the significance of that. He's talking to the king. And he says forthrightly and forcefully. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines, debauchery, drank wine from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. Ooh, getting a little hot in here. He, he, he's calling those false gods out by the name. He's saying that, that that's just baloney. Uh, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And then he described what the inscription is. And then he says... To go, he goes on to interpret it. Uh, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought you to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Daniel's saying these guys who have you under siege are going to get it. Are going to get it all. It's no longer going to be yours. And he, 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 again, he he just he just says it. He doesn't. There's no indication he's stumbling or stuttering or mumbling. He just flat out. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Before the chapter's over, we will uh, understand that that's uh, very much uh, what was going to happen because Belshazzar was slain before you even get to chapter 6. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's called confidence. In the face of overt danger. Belshazzar had the power and the authority to end Daniel. But we know that God was with Daniel. And God wasn't going to let that happen. Daniel's life wasn't going to be over until God said it was going to be over, which is the exact same for you and me. He's numbered our days. And so, after all that harsh news, what does Belshazzar do? Exactly what, what uh, King Nebuchadnezzar did said he would do, and Belshazzar said he would do, he rewarded him. Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And then there it is in verses 30 and 31. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. And we're going to see that Darius was a, was a much better guy than Belshazzar or Nebuchadnezzar. 
But the point being that when the pressure was on, when, when the danger was so thick you could cut it with a knife, Daniel showed up, stood up, and said what needed to be said without fear because he'd been living for that audience of one. And his life was very inspiring, very compelling, very encouraging, and very contagious. Uh, again, just before we end, I want to highlight back there in verse 22 to make the point that Daniel is clearly pulling no punches and withholding no truth. When the moment comes, courage does what courage is. I'm thinking about Forrest Gump. <laughs> courage does what courage is. It takes care of business. It doesn't waver. It doesn't step back. It isn't afraid. Courage is connected to the truth. The truth is afraid of nothing and can withstand anything. And so, could you imagine being in that room that day, just watching Daniel before Belshazzar? And as he started to speak, you might be going, oh, oh Turn it down, turn it down, not the, the little too hot. None of that. Because courage was there inside of Daniel, and Daniel was inside that room. When the moment comes, courage does what courage is. It cares about truth prevailing and God's will being done. It can be very inconvenient and painfully compelling. And again, for us, I'm just thinking of some, some of the social realities in the world in which we live. That the, that, the, that the culture is applauding while God weeps. And we need to be willing to stand courageous and call it what it is. And say it with grace, but say it truthfully. And say that doesn't belong, that can't be right. You're saying what used to be wrong is not right? You're saying it's no big deal? When people cross-dress and go read books at a library? You can't be okay with that. And we're going to have to courageously stand up to that. And there will be blowback. But God certainly is calling us to be like Daniel. And to be courageous. And not try to win an argument or show somebody why they're wrong. But, but just to declare and display the truth. And courage is... Courage seems to be a pretty rare commodity these days. But by God's grace, may all of us be courageous people in a world that's going to confront that for sure. Uh, again, it can be very uh, inconvenient and painfully compelling. And so when I say that we see this from Daniel chapter 5, a courageous life is the result of living for an audience of one. And a courageous life is inspiring, compelling, encouraging, contagious. The reason... The reason that second point can exist is because that first point is true. Somebody who's not living for an audience of one will not be inspiring, compelling, encouraging, contag encouraging and contagious. Oh, they may be contagious, but not the right way, not, not, with not the right thing. And so it goes back to when nobody's looking. Right? When nobody's looking, Daniel was doing what a man who's passionate for God did. When nobody's looking, you and I should be building and strengthening our relationship with God when nobody's looking except the audience of one with whom we're connected. Then we become who we're called to be and then we can do what we're called to do. Uh, I think I've referenced this before but it came to mind because I just saw him in something the other day. M most of us would know who Michael Phelps is. Uh, one of the most decorated Olympic athletes of all time. And uh, he made a comeback in 2016 and he swam in the Olympics in Rio and after some major stumbles between the previous Olympics where he just took the world by storm and this Olympics he, he trained for and got back in it was a question if he was even going to make it it was so bad um, the, uh, the manufacturer of his bodysuit that he swam in uh, was Under Armour and there was an Under Armour commercial and though I may have shared it here before, it bears repeating. If you've never heard it, I hope you'll never forget it. And they show Michael Phelps in this 
Under Armour body wear. Uh, that covers, uh, it wasn't just a pair of trunks. And, I, and, and interestingly, the, cover, the outside of it is, uh, is designed after shark skin. Literally, they used shark skin as the model to make it the most efficient as it went through the water. Hmm, I wonder who first made shark skin. Anyway, uh, so they determined this is the best way to slice through the water without illegally having an advantage. And they show Michael Phelps as he's endorsing this Under Armour swimwear at four in the morning in Baltimore, where he lives, he was living with his mom. Uh, getting up, kind of like the scene in Rocky where he gets up and drinks the eggs and just goes, you know, I gotta do this. Mike, Michael, Michael Phelps understood this. If I'm gonna win a gold medal in Rio, I'm gonna make it happen in this pool in Baltimore, where nobody's watching when he is spent from swimming, all he can spend, and then his coach says, you, you gotta lift weights and go again. Uh, kind of like Mickey with Rocky, right? You gotta go again. And, and, and he knew that, that what happened in that pool in Baltimore determined how things went in Rio. And that's what this is all about. When nobody else is looking, when you're doing what a, a, a life of a believer is supposed to, when, when you're living that life of, of, of confidence and courage, and intimacy and impact, that, that that happens because you're doing whatever it takes to position yourself to be the best you can be as God has his way. Does that make sense? Nobody else is watching but God. That's where it's won or lost. Most people, most people whose faith just falls apart or they blow up or burn out, it wasn't an explosion, it was an erosion. And then it shows up. And so that's why this is so important. That as we desire to dare to be a Daniel and learn from him, his life of courage, to ask God, oh, please make me a courageous one for you. Help me never back down. Help me not be rude or brash or unkind, but help me never back down. Because the world isn't comfortable with everything you say. And I have to say it first, I need to live it. There are going to be sparks that fly. So here's the making it real questions. Um, the, a courageous life is, is the result of living for an audience of one. Here's the uh, question. Is this your story? Would you say, honestly, that, yeah, that does describe me. I'm not perfect. I struggle at it. But I'm living that life. I, God is my audience, and I'm doing everything I can to make sure that what I do pleases Him. And if it isn't, seek God for the grace to make it so that you would be known by others as someone whose audience of one is God. That's when it's real, when other people say it about you. Even people who don't know God, they just know, man, he, she, seems to be very preoccupied with God, the audience of one. And then the second question is, uh, connected to a courageous life is inspiring, compelling, encouraging, and contagious. Who in your life has been a Daniel to you? Who, who have you seen who reminds you of this? Whose life is inspiring, compelling, encouraging, encouraging, and contagious? I can say a name that maybe, for sure one, maybe only two of you know in my life who was inspiring, compelling, encouraging, and contagious. His name is Jack Ruff. If you've never met him yet, I can't wait to introduce you to him when we get to heaven. That man, the real deal. And another one that was a part of that movement that in that particular church I was uh, involved in where I first started to pastor is a guy who's still alive who very much reminds me of Daniel. His name is John, John Williams. Examples to me of a life like Daniel's. Who is it to you that, that reminds you of Daniel? And then, if they're still alive, if you can, let them know that. Encourage the encourager, let them know that. And then, of course, along with that is, is to ask God, as we've said before, God, make me a courageous one. Make me as courageous as courageous can be. Help me never back down. Help me never be afraid. Help me, help me be more concerned with what you know than what people might think. And uh, certainly, in the New Testament, 
probably a whole other message for a whole other day about courage and commitment and confidence is uh, in the book of Acts when Stephen is stoned to death. All they could do was kill him. They couldn't stop the message. And he went down courageous. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. It's either Acts 6, 7, or 8, I think, somewhere around there. The stoning of Stephen. It's because he was a man of courage. People didn't want to hear what he had to say. Here's the action step, and we'll conclude and close in prayer. Ask God to show you how you can be more courageous in him. Don't try to be courageous in yourself or by yourself. The courage comes from the source of courage itself, himself, God himself. You can't be courage God's way without God giving you that courage, making you courageous. Ask God to show you how you can be more courageous in him. Ask him if there is anything you're shrinking back from that you should be standing up to. That's a good uh, examination question. Ask God if there is anything you're shrinking back from that you, that you should be standing up to. Is there something you're cowering before that you should be standing against? Don't let anything get bigger to you than who God is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together again today. Us being here is because somehow you ordained it and allowed it. We do think of that verse in Hebrews that says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Help us to keep getting together until this life is over. We pray today for the grace to hear and heed this message. May, may our appropriate preoccupation with you show up through our courageous living. Make us bold, make us strong, make us courageous. And God, we would ask you to burden us with what breaks your heart, starting with whatever that may be in our very own lives, in this very church. If there's anything that's breaking your heart in our lives or this church, burden us with whatever that is and help us cry the tears that it may take in response to you showing us that. And help us to cry the tears of the world when we should. There's so much heartache and hurt and pain and need for courage all over the planet. Show us who we can serve and what we can do to make this world less hurtful and less harsh. We pray again that you fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit so that we can live holy lives, the lives you call us to live. We ask that you would deliver us from settling for anything less than all that it is you desire and intend for and through us. And finally, God, once again, we bless and praise the name of Jesus, the one who was the most courageous person who ever walked this earth. May he be our ultimate example of everything good and right and true. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen. Amen. The benediction today is this. Now go and be strong and courageous by God's grace and in his strength. Do not settle for anything less than his will for and through you. Amen.